The Tom Woods Show, episode 1835. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, have you heard of ClickUp? It's the fastest growing productivity tool that's saving everyone one day a week. ClickUp is used by companies like Airbnb, Google, and Uber to get more done in less time by replacing work apps and bringing your tasks, docs, goals, chat, and more into a single place. ClickUp is free forever. So sign up today at clickup.com slash woods. Hi everybody, Tom Woods here. Jeremy Hammond joins me today. And we're gonna talk about how it is that we live in a world where true statements can't be uttered on some platforms. But obviously false or misleading ones are A-OK. What is going on in this world? So Jeremy's been on before. He was on one of our debate episodes. He is an independent journalist, publisher, and editor of Foreign Policy Journal. He's the author of numerous works on a variety of topics. He can speak intelligently on a whole lot of things. And he's been doing quite a bit of writing also about the whole virus fiasco and the the lockdowns and all that. So we're going to unpack that today. Jeremy, welcome back. Thank you. You know, you said something the other day that made me think we need to have a conversation and it was the most obvious thing in the world. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes when I read things Thomas Sowell writes, I think he's such a brilliant writer. I think to myself, doggone it, why didn't I see it that way? when it's so clear as soon as he says it. And I, I put you in the soul category because you were saying what's interesting now is that we've reached a point where there are major platforms, I guess primarily Facebook, on which there are certain clear and undisputed truths. Well, not undisputed, but I mean that have a huge amount of supporting evidence that you simply cannot say there without getting censored. And and I know, I know they're a private company and censorship. I I don't care. You all know what I mean, right? We're using censorship colloquially. You're going to get your post struck down or your account removed. But on the other hand, you can go out there and repeat clear falsehoods, things that the science understood correctly, knows to be false, but the official channels repeat them so you can repeat them. It is the most upside down, ridiculous world you can imagine. I, yeah, that is exactly what's going on. <laughs> so first of all, have you yourself evaded any, uh, let's say, social media smackdowns for any of your writing? So far, so far, I haven't had any, um, you know, like Facebook putting their, you know, false information flag on, on my, anything that I've personally written. Of course, I have, I've linked to, you know, I've posted links to other people's work that have been censored. And then I've written articles about how those fact check articles misinform the public, <laughs> you know, yeah, and it is. This has been going on for some time, and it predates the pandemic. Going back to February 2019, Adam Schiff wrote a letter to to Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, along with the CEOs of Google and Amazon, um, requesting them to prevent people from seeing any information that might lead them to not want to vaccinate their children, for example. And so this has been going on for some time. And of course, now with the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown responses, it's just escalated to a point where, I mean, it's really frightening what's happening. I mean, I would like to say it's ridiculous, but it's not funny at all. It's, it, it is really frightening what's happening because what's happening is our right to informed consent is under assault and our, and our, our liberties are under assault. And so the, there is this threat of authoritarianism. And essentially, you know, the mainstream media have been, have been pushing for this, the corporate media have been pushing for this type of censorship because they want to maintain their own monopoly over the spread of misinformation. And we want to talk about misinformation. There are no greater purveyors of misinformation than the U.S. government and, and the mainstream me corporate media. And on that question of censorship, it is censorship. And I'll tell you why, because it's, it's not a question of, well, they're a private company and they can do what they want and they can, they can allow whatever speech they want. That's not the issue. The issue is that they are doing this on behalf of the government. And they're doing so in a way that is complicit in violating our fundamental human rights. And so it is censorship because they're doing this in service to the state. You know, your introduction there described it perfectly. What is happening is that they are preventing certain truths you know, from the public being made aware of certain truths while themselves spreading all kinds of misinformation. And Facebook just recently, just in the last several days, updated its policies with respect to what it is going to censor. And I mean, it's telling us... <laughs> There's such clear examples in its updated guidance now and its updated policies of how it is going to prevent truths from being told 
and while allowing, while enabling the government and media to outright lie to us. And I, just to give you a very clear, explicit example. So Facebook's new policy says that if you say that COVID-19 vaccines are not approved, your post will be removed and you risk being deplatformed. So again, if you say that COVID-19 vaccines are not approved, well, they're not approved. COVID-19 vaccines are not FDA approved. In fact, if you look at the emergency use authorization, if you look, actually not even those documents, if you look at the, the information that healthcare providers are supposed to provide to recipients of the vaccines from the FDA, says right in it, there are no FDA approved vaccines for COVID-19. This is right from the FDA. And this is the information that the public is supposed to be getting, but they're not. So Michigan state government, for example, tells people that the vaccines have been approved the same as every other licensed vaccine on the market. That's false. And then, of course, the healthcare organizations like McLaren Health here in Northern Michigan tells people that it repeats the same misinformation from the state of Michigan. So you have government agencies, you have medical establishment itself complicit in what's uninformed consent. I mean, they're, they're manufacturing consent for policies such as, you know, the stay at home orders, for mask wearing orders, for the vaccination program on the basis of falsehoods and preventing people from being able to, to learn the truth about things. And in Facebook's, of course, how does Facebook determine what's true and what's not? Well, they tell us. It says right in the new policy guidance document that they rely on public health authorities. So whatever public health authorities say is true, is true. And whatever they say is false, is false. And that's their criterion for determining truth. It's absurd. And of course, of course, the people advocating these policies are going to say that these policies work, that everything they say in support of those policies is true. And, and every, you know, and whatever critics might have to say about these policies is false. This is so obvious. And yet, this is the standard that Facebook is, has adopted. And again, in service, you know, under incredible pressure from Congress, from the mainstream media to engage in this type of censorship. I don't avoid that word. It is censorship. And that, you know, also these big tech companies have actually gotten into pharmaceuticals. So Facebook, Google, Amazon, they've all ventured into the pharmaceutical industry themselves. And so they have, they have their own interests in kind of censoring certain types of information. And so it's really gotten, it's really gotten to a state while I just say it's frightening, I actually see it as an opportunity because it's kind of been going on. And, and I think most people have kind of been unaware of it. Most people haven't really been affected by it. But with the COVID-19 pandemic and the way it's escalated now, where you have like the, the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration being their Facebook page being deleted from Facebook, it's become so obvious. And, and I think it's become, you know, now you have people like Glenn Greenwald talking about the censorship. You know, you have people like, Freddie Sayers from Unheard TV talking about the censorship. It's really gone mainstream. It's kind of an opportunity in the sense that an awakening is happening as to what's going on and how our rights are under assault. The Great Barrington Declaration thing you mentioned just now is particularly striking. Now, if people go to Facebook and they type in Great Barrington Declaration, they will see a Facebook page, but that is not the one we're talking about. So it's not that, oh, since that episode appeared, they had their page restored. No. That's a page with very few people on it, and that is just created by a supporter of the Great Barrington Declaration. Their official page, with I don't know how many likes they had on it, was taken down. Now, the Great Barrington Declaration, virtually everybody listening to it knows what that is, and it's not even particularly radical, honestly. I mean, anybody looking at it in 2019 would think it was pretty mainstream. It's, it's drafted by professors from Oxford, Harvard, and Stanford, so if, if, if they get their stuff taken down, what hope do the rest of us have? And the thing is, it's not even like they were taking a position that the vaccines are not a good idea or something like that. They were pro-vaccination. So even that wasn't enough to protect them from being taken down. And this idea of the lockdowns, which is really what the Great Barrington Declaration is primarily aimed against, is also one of the things that you're not really permitted to, to question I had a video taken down from YouTube. I've never in my life had a video taken down from, never. And everything I said in it is completely defensible, as I'm sure you know, but they just couldn't get over my claim that uh, the lockdowns don't seem to do much good. But at this point, I don't know, what are there, two dozen peer-reviewed papers on this already in scientific and other journals making exactly the same claim? Yeah, certainly. I mean, there, I mean there's, there's studies 
both ways. I mean, there are studies that support the use of, of masks, um, and there's studies that suggest that they're not effective. Um, and particularly, you know, we, when we talk about studies, there's observational studies, and then there's like randomized controlled trials. And, and interestingly, the RCTs, randomized controlled trials that look at mask effectiveness, don't find that they're effective. <laughs> so the, the best type of scientific evidence finds no effect. And of course, you know, there's mechanistic studies and, and, you know, the theoretical, you know, the idea that, well, of course, it's going to, you know, block the droplets. Uh, it's going to prevent the droplets from, from being expelled. And so that, that makes a lot of sense. And it does make sense to wear masks in certain situations. But this brings me into, so for example, the Facebook policy says that, you know, if you claim that public health authorities do not recommend that healthy people wear masks, your post will be removed. And they give an example. So the WHO, the WHO, does not recommend that healthy people wear masks. So if you say that, your post will be removed. But the thing is, is if we look back at the WHO's initial guidance on masks, they stated that healthy people are not recommended to wear masks. And then they updated that guidance uh, in early June. And to this day, they still do not recommend that healthy people wear masks in circumstances where prolonged close contact is avoidable. And this brings to mind, there was a, a WHO press conference with Maria Van Kerkhove, who was the technical lead for their COVID-19 uh, response. And there were three of them up on the, on the stage giving this you know, virtual press conference. And um, they took questions at the end. And one of the, one of the audience asked, you know, how come you guys aren't wearing masks? And, and they said, well, we don't need to wear masks because we're more than two meters apart. So you know, there's all kinds of nuances. And the fact is, is that like you showed in your video, when you showed those all those charts and graphs and said, you know, it's obvious that the masking has no observable effect on the course of the pandemic, on the epidemic waves. It's, it's the same with the lockdown measures. I mean, there's numerous studies finding that the, you know, stay at, the extreme measures like stay-at-home orders, business closures, are not associated with reduced mortality from COVID-19. They are not. And, and of course, they, they might be very much associated with increased mortality from other causes, especially when we start looking globally. We look, start looking, you know, at, at the developing world, you know, in, in looking at UN estimates of the impact of the, the global lockdown measures in the developing world and increases in excess infant mortality, excess deaths from starvation. These policies are devastating. And, you know, <laughs> apart from our rights being under assault, I mean, the, the, these policies have harms. And of course, the people advocating these policies, like Anthony Fauci, they openly acknowledge that they, they haven't taken the costs into consideration. Fauci has acknowledged that. You know, you look at uh, the Imperial College paper that came out in March, Neil Ferguson and his colleagues there, you know, they state right in that paper that they didn't consider the costs of the policy they were advocating. How can you advocate a policy like this and not consider the costs? So they're not doing a cost-benefit analysis. They're not doing any kind of risk-benefit analysis. And they're pushing these policies on us that, as you've pointed out so, so well for so long, you know, they're not having the intended effect. And so this is the state of affairs where you're, and you're not even allowed to criticize anymore, uh, essentially. Or you're not, in other words, you're not allowed even to say that there are other factors to be considered. These people have said, no, there aren't. Or they haven't actually made that declaration, have they? They've just said, we're not doing it. They haven't said that you shouldn't look at any cost. They've just said, well, we're not taking that into account. But the social media people have extrapolated from that to, well, you're not allowed to consider any factors other than the one Dr. Fauci is considering. So the, the virus you can talk about. The dozen ways that the so-called mitigation policies are harming the public well, that's not really, and, and by the way, I just said this the other day with James Dellingpole that one of the criticisms of my video was I claimed that these behemoths like the World Health Organization were refusing to acknowledge the collateral damage of their policies. And this was fact-checked because in October, my video was given in early November. In October, the WHO had said, oh, you know, there seem to be some side effects from lockdowns. That's supposed to refute me. So March was when we started to get these policies. It took them seven months buried somewhere in a document to point out that there might be consequences to this. And so that means I'm wrong. Right. <laughs> I never hear any acknowledgement of collateral damage from anybody. I think Fauci himself might have acknowledged it in the past few months saying we really, really want to have lockdowns be an absolute last resort because they do have so many damaging aspects to them. So we got that, but it took them forever even to say it 
And only they are allowed to say it. And they can say it for three seconds and then they're back on to how many masks you should have on. <laughs> right. Well, going back to the beginning, I mean, if you, if you recall, we were told that it was just a temporary measure. Maybe several weeks we would have to stay in lockdown, you know, do social distancing uh, just as a temporary measure to flatten the curve. Remember flatten the curve? <laughs> oh, geez, yeah. And then, of course, they shifted and, and then it became, oh, no, we need to continue doing this until there's a vaccine. And then we're going to mass vaccinate everybody and then we're going to all be fine. And that was their plan. I mean, this is their plan. This is the whole end game of the lockdown measures. And of course, we were told, Congress was told by Fauci, you know, that COVID-19 has a death rate 10 times that of influenza. So he said influenza's fatality rate is 0.1%. So this is another thing in, in Facebook's new policy. They say that, you know, if you claim that COVID-19 is no more dangerous to people than the common flu or cold, your post will be removed. Well, even the CDC's best estimate of the infection fatality rate, overall infection fatality rate for COVID-19 is 0.26%, but that's not age stratified. So more recently, they've done age stratified infection fatality rates. And so for anyone under 50, the infection fatality rate is less than 0.1%. So for children, for anyone under 20, it's 0.003%, according to the CDC. For anyone under 50, excluding those under 20, it's 0.02%. And that's most of the U.S. population. So for most of the U.S. population, the risk from COVID-19 is less than the risk we're told by Anthony Fauci is the risk of dying from influenza. But you can't say that or you'll be censored. You know, or JAMA Pediatrics, the journal, the, the American Medical Association Pediatrics Journal, has said children face a far greater risk of critical illness from influenza than from COVID-19. But if you say that, now you risk being censored. There's just example after example of how they're trying to prevent certain types of information. You know, essentially, here's the criteria. If the misinformation helps to manufacture consent for these authoritarian policies, then it's fine. You know, only if the information, whether no matter how factual it is, that might lead people to dissent from these policies and criticize these policies and, and, and protest these policies, that that must be, you know, people can't be exposed to that type of information. So it, it, the hypocrisy is just, it's, it's, it's incredible and it's just outrageous. And, and it's gotten so blatant now. I mean, it's, it's like they're not even trying <laughs> to pretend that they have some other type of criterion. Hey, folks, let's take a quick minute to thank our sponsor. I heard a crazy statistic the other day. Apparently, the average person is productive for less than three hours out of an eight-hour workday. So that means five hours of wasted time. How can that be normal? Well, normal and try ClickUp. ClickUp helps you break the norm and get more done in less time by replacing all your unorganized work apps and bringing your tasks, docs, goals, chats, and more into a single shared workspace. ClickUp's customer service is unmatched and they're making the world infinitely more productive. So join over 100,000 teams at companies like Airbnb, Google, and Uber who already use ClickUp to level up their productivity. With ClickUp, you'll save one day every week guaranteed, which means more time to spend with family, taking that ultimate road trip, or whatever you want to spend more time doing. ClickUp is free forever. So sign up today at clickup.com slash woods. You know, you were saying about initially it was a few weeks and you know, we were going to have to make a big sacrifice, but then we would reevaluate and maybe be okay. Now, I was just reading somebody in the UK saying this, and it's such a good point. Now they'll say, okay, we need to lock down again for another four weeks. And, and they treat it like nothing. Like before it was, okay, look, this is a, we're really going to have to hunker down and be in this together. And and uh, we know this is highly unusual, but it's very dangerous. We got to get the hot. Now it's, yeah, four more weeks. We'll get back to you. You know, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe we'll lift it. Maybe we won't. Maybe there'll be more restrictions. Maybe you can't even exercise alone outside, which I just read. There's some place where that's the case. Now it's just like, we're just nothing. We deserve no consideration whatsoever. Just, ah, you know what? We're going to lock you up for five more weeks and, you know, maybe it'll be more, but we'll let you know. Right. And, you know, the really scary thing to me is, is how widely accepted these policies have been, you know, because people are so scared, so afraid, you know, they, they take, they listen to Anthony Fauci say things like this is 10 times deadlier than the flu. And of course, you don't see Facebook fact checking that type of misinformation. And, and he had no way of knowing that at the time, by the way, they had no idea what the true infection rate was, you know, they, they were the denominator they were looking at was just the reported cases, which of course, inherently overestimates 
Uh, but you know, of course, they don't take the they don't do the nuance of explaining all that to the public, and so that type of misinformation is fine. Um, <laughs> but another example: so claims that the number of COVID nineteen caused deaths are much lower than the official figure. This is another thing in Facebook's policy, and, and they say that this requires additional information or context. So here's the thing: the numbers of COVID nineteen deaths in my state of Michigan it, it varies by jurisdiction, but it, here in Michigan, if someone dies after having received a positive PCR test they're automatically counted as a COVID-19 death. And, you know, and sometimes they go, you know, they might investigate and go back and say, oh, well, no, this person actually died from this or that. And they might kind of remove those, those counts. But, but that's, that's just the automatic, you know, that's how they're doing it. If you look at their criteria, if you get a positive PCR test, of course, just because you have a positive PCR test doesn't mean that you, you even have an infection. So the PCR tests, what they do is, is they detect fragments of RNA from, from SARS-CoV-2 you know, we have all these cases based on PCR, positive PCR tests, where the so-called cases, you know, these people might not even ha- have an infection. And so this is problematic, but you can't talk about that, you know, because you're going to be censored if you talk about this type of thing. Going back to what you were talking about, you have a situation where people have accepted, you know, governments declaring what types of businesses are, quote unquote, essential or not. What types of businesses are non-essential? The lack of resistance to this outright authoritarianism and on what grounds are they, are they making this determination? It's completely arbitrary. You know, like here in Michigan, Whitmer at one point back in last spring banned people from being able to access you know, the gardening centers of, you know, like Home Depot or Walmart and things. She shut those down. You're not, not allowed to go buy seeds, you know, during planting season. So obviously she had no consideration for how this was going to affect small farmers and, and you know, greenhouse growers. And of course, you know, they lost their ability to distribute and they were, you know, they're starting to go out of business and starting to really struggle uh, on account of these policies. And she actually later did reverse that one. Um, but I mean, it's just a good example of how, you know, these clueless politicians are implementing these policies by fiat. And, and incidentally, also, you know, the Supreme Court here in Michigan actually overturned her lockdown measures. But, but then now what's happening is you just get the Department of Health and Human Services here in Michigan is saying, oh, well, you know, you still have to wear a mask. You still have to do all this and that. And so they're claiming to have the same authority that, that Whitmer was claiming to have had. But of course, she, she doesn't have because, of course, the legislature can't delegate its authorities to the executive. So it's, it's the same illogic. It's the same fallacy there in terms of the authority. But this is, you know, it's scary how, how much people have just given their consent for these things, although at the same time it is encouraging that there is an awakening happening. And, and, and from the beginning, many people have, have protested, you know, these and criticized these, uh, these policies and rightly so. But I think it's gotten to the point where people have just had enough. And I think more and more people are awakening to the reality of how harmful these policies are and how ineffective they are for the goal and, and, and all the unintended consequences, unintended but easily predictable harmful consequences. It's so strange that more people haven't changed their minds on this. I've been talking about this this week also. But the key thing to me is that they've observed that they do things and nothing seems to happen. Like in Florida, in Florida, I, again, I keep saying this. I've gone to a play three times. I've gone to a play, like with an audience. I've gone to the King Center in Melbourne and seen a comedy show. I have, I have concert tickets. I've traveled the world. I've done this, that, and the other thing. And it doesn't seem like any of these gatherings, I mean, yeah, we keep hearing about super spreader events, but that's almost entirely political. We were supposed to have a big super spreader event because what? We had the national championship uh, football game. And then you look at the health results in that area in the weeks afterward and everything, all the numbers are down. So there's no, there's no one saying, huh, gee, I guess we shouldn't have jumped the gun, panicking everybody about that. It turned out okay. I wonder why. There's the words that are missing. I wonder why. I wonder why I look at pictures of people in Florida and they're all packed together in a bar and they're still doing better than California where no one can go in a bar. I wonder why. And yet we have so little curiosity. Those three magic words, I wonder why, just never seem to get uttered. No, they never question their own policies. I mean, even, you know, when like not so long ago, they were saying, well, if everyone just wear, wears a mask, this we can end this thing. <laughs> Yeah, they were saying that like six, eight months ago, and we've been wearing them nonstop. And even in places where they don't have mask mandates, you know, there's no state mandate. A lot of times there are local mandates or county mandates, Mm -hmm. and people are wearing them. I mean, in Florida, 
where we're open with no state imposed capacity restrictions. I see masks everywhere. There was a big to do about Naples. There was a grocery store where people weren't wearing masks and and Shepard Smith posted this and how scandalized he was. That is highly unusual. I've never seen a store like that. Highly unusual. And incidentally, our friend Ian Miller on Twitter, who's the creator of so many of these great graphs, went ahead and did a a graph of, I don't know if it was hospitalizations or deaths or which metric he used, but he thought, well, let me compare the county that Naples, Florida is in. I'll graph that. And then I'll graph a county in California that's had one of the earliest mask mandates. And let's see what the results are. And of course, the Florida county is doing way, way better. And yet that's the one that Shep Smith wants to pick on. Right. And then, of course, there's the example of Sweden, which... (laughs) has been the focus of so much attention over all these months. The data don't support the claims about the effectiveness of these policies. You know, of course, what they say in Sweden is they say, oh, well, look, it's Sweden compared to, you know, it's it's neighbors there and and it has a a higher death rate per capita, which is true. But it also has a a lower death rate per capita than many of the lockdown countries in Europe, uh, including the UK. And if you look at what happened, One of the criticisms of the Great Barrington Declaration is that, well, it's not feasible to do focused protection. It's not feasible to just, you know, protect just those at high risk. And therefore, we have to have these indiscriminate policies to to keep everyone away from each other. It is interesting because if you look at, you know, what happened in Sweden, you know, their their policy failure, which they have acknowledged, was that they didn't protect the highest risk people in elderly care homes. But you look at the lockdown measures in in the U.S., More than 40% of deaths have been linked to nursing care homes. In in many states, it's it's over half. So in many states, more than 50% of deaths were were linked to nursing care homes. And if you look at those numbers, it's been a while since I looked at it, but last time I looked at that, there was something like two dozen lockdown states where more than 50% of the deaths were in in nursing care homes. Uh, And so obviously, the lockdown measures completely failed utterly, totally fail to protect those at highest risk. This is obvious. And yet, you know, we're being told that the idea of focused protection is nonsense because, you know, because we, we can't we can't protect people. Well, it might be worth trying, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, at least to try. Yeah, yeah, they haven't. They haven't. And I keep saying, if what they're telling us is true, and I think it's that they generally just don't understand the virus as well as they think they do. They clearly do not. I could imagine a virus, maybe it's possible there's a virus that acts the way they think this one does. But I don't understand how it's possible that the curves all come down even in places where they didn't do anything. They didn't change any of their behavior at all. And we can measure this, thank goodness, because we have Google mobility data. Yeah, you know, Google's a crummy company and we don't like it, but it sure bails us out of this situation because we can show people haven't. There'll be cases where people have not changed their behavior in terms of mobility, and yet that curve comes down anyway, and we've got so little attempt to try to explain why that is. But also, if what they're telling us is true, Sweden shouldn't be, you know, in the middle of the pack in terms of countries. Sweden shouldn't be better than anyone. It shouldn't be better than than the UK and a bunch of other – it shouldn't be better than anyone It should be the number one death destination times a thousand. Even if it were just 15% worse, I would think that would be a major indictment of this hysterical overreaction. Right. But it's not. In the beginning when Sweden didn't follow suit and and didn't lock down like the other countries in Europe, that's exactly what they were predicting. They were predicting just mass death. And of course, that that never came to be. And, you know, talking about how they... (laughs) They don't even look, you know, when was the last time you heard in the mainstream discourse, the discussion about the seasonality of the, of the virus? And it's, it's as though, you know, during the summer, when, when case numbers came down, at least in certain regions of the U.S. and then in, in other regions, just due to climate and, and variance, you know, you had kind of, they kind of hit their first wave. And so when you look at that data compiled as the U.S. total, you know, you kind of have this kind of series of waves. But really, it was really just two waves in each location. So one in, one in the spring and then one again come fall. But they don't even talk about that. So it's, it's as though, well, you know, it's as though in the summer, case numbers came down because we had all these lockdown measures and people were, you know, obeying their government. But then when, when case numbers started to rise again in the fall, 
did you hear about seasonality? No, it's, oh, well, you know, all the idiots aren't following their orders, you know, to, to stay at home and to, to not to go out and, and wear their masks. Like, that's the level of the discussion. There's not even, a, like you said, you know, they, they talk, about, talk about it as if they know so much, but, they, you know, the information that they, they give to the public, they seem completely clueless. Whereas, like you said, there's a lot of independent researchers, people on Twitter, you know, sharing good information, you know, going in, digging through the data, producing graphs and charts, saying, look, this is this is the reality. This is what the data actually show us. And, you know, this is one of the problems is that, and then this is another good benefit, I think, of what's happened, you know, to, to look at the glasses that have full is that people are starting to become aware of how, you know, what the government and media say science says and what science actually tells us are two completely different things. And this is really, really important to understand. I can't help repeating something that I know I've said this a bunch of times lately, but it's just one of my favorite things to say, and and we'll wrap up. But somebody on Twitter was saying, you know, I'm looking at Florida's results and they they just look very average to me. And so I, I came back with, okay, I live in Florida, so I'm very sensitive to this. And when Florida officially reopened in September, where there were, you know, that he threw off all state imposed restrictions. People were not saying, the, the hysterics were not saying, hey, if you do that, if you lift all the restrictions, let me warn you, your results are going to be very average. <laughs> I assure you, Jeremy, nobody was saying that. It was, <laughs> there are going to be piles of corpses as far as the eye can see. Right. They did not say, you know, your results are going to be. So now the fact that they're reduced to saying, well, I've looked at the numbers and I think it's just they're very average. For a state with some of the oldest people in the country to have results that are, quote, very average, according to its worst critics, is an amazing accomplishment that, again, should make them say, I wonder why. But they have no wonder because they think science is a series of certainties it has crushed their ability to wonder. And Plato used to say that the beginning of wisdom is the attitude of wonder, and it's completely squashed. Share with us your final words, and then how can people follow you if they want to uh, hear more of what you have to say? Yeah, so I, just to sum it all up, you know, we are being lied to. We're being deceived. And we're being told that you know, these policies are necessary in the name of, quote-unquote, the science but I really encourage people just to do their own research, to look at what the science says, look at the data for yourselves, think for yourself and, and draw your own conclusions and understand that it's, it's not just that we're being misinformed, but our rights are under assault. Private property rights, the right to informed consent is under assault. They're, they've been waging a war on our right to informed consent for some time. And so it's really important for people to be aware that this is happening and how it's happening and how consent is manufactured you know, and I'm borrowing that term from Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman, who, you know, who wrote the book, Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media, whom, you know, um, our friend Gene Epstein and I have some criticisms of, of that book and, and its criticisms of the free market and attributing this to the free market when it's actually attributable to what I like to call the state religion, also borrowing from Noam Chomsky. This is how the society is functioning. You know, they have this institutionalized biases that people need to be aware of that explain. It's not a conspiracy. It's just, it's just, these biases exist in institutions. And if you understand how these systems work, you can understand how it can be that, that the information that we're being told, the science, uh, is really a farce. And so I, that's, the, I guess, the take-home message. Uh, to find me, I'm at jeremyrhammond.com. And so I encourage people to visit my website and sign up for my newsletter. And uh, I've been focused really heavily on, on the COVID-19, the pandemic, the pandemic responses, I've um, been writing about vaccines for quite some time, quite a few years. So you know, constantly giving out information, good science-backed studies, sharing the data, and just exposing the propaganda. So I encourage people to sign up for my newsletter at jeremyrhammond.com. All right, I'll link to that also at tomwoods.com slash 1835. And Jeremy, I appreciate it, especially on such short notice. I emailed you last night and said, hey, could you come out tomorrow morning? <laughs> and you accommodated me. So I appreciate that a lot. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. All right, folks, before we go, I want to tell you about what is coming up next week because a lot of you are really, really going to like it. Before I do that, I want to make good. I promoted a website in the past and I I didn't do it correctly. So I want to, I mean, I I did it like 50% of the way, but I want to do it again for the sake of justice here. And that is the site Grantly, G-R-A-N-T-L-I.com. And it's a place where you can go to find all kinds of opportunities to get grant money. 
And yes, you will indeed find government grant programs here, but also a great many private grant programs as well. And they're going to give you all kinds of articles, resources, training courses to teach you how to get funding, how to find it, how to tell your story, how to do your work. So the site is grantly.com, G-R-A-N-T-L-I.com. And I'll link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1835. And of course, the usual point applies. You can get publicity from me for a site you're thinking of starting. But before you start it, go to tomwoods.com slash publicity and find out about all the goodies that you'll get that don't cost you a thing. All you got to do is get your web hosting, which you need anyway, through my link. And then for nothing, I'll actually get people to go to your website. How about that? So I'll put Grantly at tomwoods.com slash 1835. And then if you want the details on how you can get stuff like this, uh, publicity for me, that's tomwoods.com slash publicity. Now, coming up next week, it is, for the second time, Scott Horton Week. Scott Horton is our great foreign policy expert, and he is out with a brand new book, the one we've all been waiting for, called Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And it is fantastic, outstanding. And we are going to have a heck of a week together unpacking a lot of the great ideas in there. So make sure and join me for that. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.